Moritz Escher was born on June 17, 1898. And he was the fifth and last child of George Escher, an engineer. Moritz, who was also known as Mauk to his family and close friends, had four older brothers. So from 1912 to 1918, he attended secondary school in Arnhem. During his stay there, he made his first prints, 24 linoleum cuts and a couple of etchings. Although bright, Escher was not a good student, particularly in mathematics. And he was actually forced to repeat one of his years of high school. On the plus side, he made several lifelong friends there. And as we will see, the school building itself made a big impact on Escher. In 1919, he entered the School of Architecture and Decorative Arts in Harlem. And he was first planning to, to study architecture and to become an architect. Um, after a few months, however, one of the teachers there suggested that he instead should concentrate on printmaking and that changed Escher's life. I wanna show you um, some of the images that Escher produced in his youth. Um, in 1921, Escher, who was then 23, created 19 woodcuts as illustrations for a booklet titled Fleur de Pasqua or um, Easter Flower that was written by one of his friends. The complete suite, or most of the complete suite, I should say, is in the exhibition. I wanna quickly show you just a few from that um, suite, which I just like. Here we have um, on the left, um, fulfillment, um, which to me is just amazing because already at this early age, you can see Escher um, being really interested in pattern and manipulating pattern and um, just varying them to create an extraordinary image. Um, I can't tell you what this image has to do with fulfillment, but um, that's part of the fun of going through this uh, little booklet. Um, on the right is a slide called um, Madonna. Um, I think that sort of comes without um, much explanation. Um, but again, you already see Escher's interest in pattern um, coming to the fore. Um, there are a couple of other um, prints from that suite that I just want to mention uh, briefly. This is um, one of the first ones in the uh, um, suite. It's called Scapegoat. And you can see how um, the black figure is the devil, the white figure is a goat, but if you look at it the other way, it's um, a portrait of Christ. Um, the interesting thing about this for me is um, when I was looking at this print, I remember seeing a photograph of Escher like when he was 50 years after he made this print. And so I put it up here. To me, it's just kind of funny how much Escher looks like that devil um, that he did when he was 23 years old. And another um, one more um, print from that suite is called Sphere, and it's really one of the very first um, examples of Escher using a sphere for um, self-portraits. And I show here just um, on the right, if you come to the exhibition, you can actually see this um, lithograph, which is just, I mean, it's amazing. But um, you can see in the background, this is a sphere that Escher bought. Um, it's like a common garden sphere that you would put on a stick in your garden. And you can see on the right that there's the hole where the stick would go. But Escher kept this and used it in so many of his self-portraits and other prints. But here back in 1921, 
he's already made his initial foray into um, reflective portraiture. In September 1922, Escher traveled by freighter to Spain, where he visited the Alhambra, the great Moorish palace in Granada. Um, he made drawings of the plain filling um, decorations that um, adorn the Alhambra. And these decorations, like um, this is one of his watercolors after one of those, um, really had a great impact on his um, art for the rest of his career. As Escher actually later in his life, he said, long before I discovered in the Alhambra an affinity with Moorish art, I had recognized this interest in myself. So it was already bubbling there, but this trip to the Alhambra and he made subsequent trips there really brought this to the fore in his art. This is one of the earliest of the symmetry um, watercolors that Escher made um, starting in the early 20s. Um, he um, used this, let me go back. He used this watercolor and just see how the patterning goes to create, I think one of the most striking works in the exhibition. This um, two foot by six foot um, tapestry that you can see before you. Uh, below are um, the set of wood blocks that he used to make this tapestry. Uh, the textile creatures um, in this tapestry are far more articulated than the ones in the watercolor that we saw. But um, here, I think what you really get a sense of is the technical virtuosity behind this beautiful tapestry. Escher made three blocks, um, one for the blue and gold lions, one for the red ones, and one for the gold outlines of the ivory lions, where the color comes from the silk itself. Now, I said this is very labor intensive. Just consider the fact that the three blocks were printed 133 times without any visible trace of misalignment. This is a remarkable bit of technical artistry, particularly for a young artist starting out. And this was one of his first forays into printing on a fabric rather than on paper. One of the artist's favorite spots was Ravello, located on the Amalfi Coast south of Naples. Over the years, the beauty of this region around Ravello inspired many of his prints, but it was one of the non-landscape sites that particularly captivated him. In 1923, during a stay at the Albergo del Toro Hotel in Ravello, he met Jetta Umaker, who was staying there with her parents. Um, Escher fell head over heels in love with her. And in fact, between these two prints, um, about nine months um, between February 24th and when he made the portrait of Yetta um, on August 1924, when he was married. Um, so um, it's about a nine month period between the two. Um, he did no other printmaking. He, he was totally focused on Yetta. Um, seven years later, they returned to Ravello where Escher made that pastel that we saw above. Let's see this beautiful pastel. Um, in 1925, they settled in Rome. During the spring and summer, Escher often made lengthy month long journeys into the Italian hinterlands, making drawings of sights motifs that caught his eye. As he wrote, quote, I know of no greater pleasure than to wander over the hills and through vales from village to village, 
feeling the effects of unspoiled nature and enjoying unexpected and unlooked for pleasures. Here we see Escher on one of these treks through the mountains of Abruzzi with his friend, the Swiss artist, Giuseppe Haas Triviero and their faithful baggage carrier. Escher recorded his journeys in a travel diary. This page that we see here is from May, 1929. In late May, the pair spent a few days in and around the village of Scano. Escher made several sketches there, including this one in the exhibition dated May 20th. Three days earlier, he had made, he had drawn a woman seating along a street um, who was um, knitting. Um, a very quick sketch, if you look in the upper right corner of this drawing, um, it was a very quick sketch, which he later developed into a more finished study. The woman reappeared eight months later in a lithograph titled Street in Scano that is included in the exhibition. This work, not often exhibited or discussed in the literature, is a wonder. The multiple and varied stairways, even look here, even in, the, in this print, the street itself becomes a stairway, is fantastic. And the steep and undulating perspective that we see here anticipates later more unnatural works, as we will see. Now, as amazing as this image seems to be, as unreal as it seems to be, it's actually very close to reality, as this photograph on the right, made close to 60 years later, proves. The same return trip to Ravello that um, the couple made led to um, this remarkable print of a covered alley Escher encountered in the town of Atrani. This is the first wood engraving the artist had attempted, a technique where he cut into a more difficult to find and more expensive block of denser end grain wood, which is very different from, um, this is a sort of cross section kind of wood. Um, what he usually used for his woodcuts were just a basic plank, which is cut from um, the up and down part of the tree. So the length of the tree. The uniformly density of the wood, pear wood in this case, which was one of his favorites, allowed the artist to achieve greater detail as he could cut very fine lines across the block in any direction as the array of fine white lines here reveals. The delicate highlights also draw attention to the dark, deep shadows and sharp angles of the stairs and walls. About th this work, and which along with three others was published in 1940 in an edition of uh, a very distinguished arts journal called Halcyon, Escher wrote that he previously had never been able to print such um, deep, dark, rich images um, that also at the same time he could retain by using, by doing these really fine, fine lines. This is the, this is the beginning of the mature Escher as a printmaker, I think. Here's one of two other wood grain, um, wood engravings that were published in that Halcyon article. In May, of 1922, 13 years before the print, Escher observed that while on a walk in the hills around Siena, he encountered um, and, and studied the earth. And he said, the earth was mostly dark red here. I saw a large beetle, which was pushing a big ball of plant fiber and dirt up the hillside, walking backwards. The ball had a diameter of three centimeters. This is how Escher's brain works. He's thinking, yeah, that's a three centimeter ball. The female was following her mate. Both beetles were completely black. 
Okay, so Escher drew this pair on the spot, saved it for 13 years, and then suddenly it occurred to him, well, why don't I use that to make a print? Look at how he met the challenge of recreating this memory from 13 years earlier, through the drawing and then putting that into the print. How is he going to create the glowing highlights where the sunlight struck the shiny armor of the beetles? This is how he's trying to imagine this. Well, he comes up with the idea he uses a gradual transition between these white and black dots to help him create a kind of gray. Look at how he, he conveys the density, the volume of the ball that the beetle, that the beetles um, push and pull and how he creates. And here, I don't know if it's from memory or just his imagination, the strange, almost otherworldly background. The same determined focus, attention to detail and masterful technique can also be seen in its pendant image of a grasshopper. Now, during their stay in Rome, which was from about 1930, no, 1925 to 35, um, Escher um, you know, lived there in Rome, uh, made, his, made his trips. But during one time, Escher's son, George, um, recalled how he had found a grasshopper on the steps of their home. Later, years later, he said how he showed it to his father and that the artist immediately took it up to his studio and carefully copied its complex and varied surface patterns. Quote, in order to see it, I had to draw it, Escher told his son. As was the case with scarabs, here we see the artist's obsession with pattern, his thrill with rendering the beauty of the natural world around him. Both works were printed in 1935 during Escher's final year in Rome. To escape fascism and to improve the health of their children, the Eschers moved north first to Switzerland and then to Brussels and the Netherlands. This change of venue would see Escher shift from representing the world he could see around him to the world inside of his brain, to what he could think, imagine, and create. But before we move to the North with him, I wanna make a brief detour. Although we can appreciate these Italian landscapes and motifs today, and only recently has this appreciation arisen, they were not very popular or profitable in, its, in their day. The Eschers weren't starving, but they were unable to live very well on the proceeds, solely on the proceeds from Escher's art. Sometime around 1931, Escher was approached by his friend, the art historian Hogewerf, who was also the director of the Dutch Historical Institute in Rome. He suggested to Escher that the artist should create an emblemata, a collection of illustrated epigrams accompanied by Latin mottos, which Hogeverf himself would contribute under the pseudonym of A.E. Dreifhout. If you look closely at this photo, you can see on the table Escher's inkstone and roller and next to them, an impression of the second title page of what eventually became the emblemata. You can see it here on the left. The print includes a visually astonishing peacock and describes the images as symbols or zinnebilden, the epigrams as quote, adage verses and lists the individual con contributions of Escher and Mr. Dreyfout. I must admit that before I worked on this exhibition, I paid little attention to these emblemata. The Latin was rather difficult, even for a Latin major like me, as were the epigrams, 
In fact, you should see what Google Translate makes out of some of them. But I'm fascinated by these small wonders. They have really been the revelation of the exhibition for me. So let's take a look at a few of them. In the print on the right called Lute, the Latin above reads, soft sounds conquer spoken words, while the epigram below can be translated, do you yearn for happiness and muted song? The chords of your youth will resound for centuries. Now, the variety of patterns here, wall, floor, lute, and strings is remarkable, almost musical, as a friend told me. Here is harmony, memory, that is nostalgia expressed in the epigram, rendered with technical virtuosity to create on a small scale, something beyond the mundane and every day. The same is true for the emblem beehive, where the enigmatic Latin motto reads, in a storm, perseverance is futile. And the epigram, industry comforts us, hard work with no respite provided only if the elements do not storm while we are at work. Hardly comforting sentiments, but the image itself is amazing. A howling thunderstorm seems to attack the humble basket beehive, known as a skep, but it remains solid and stable, the bees safe inside, calmly enduring nature's fury, lightning, driving rain, and wind, which bends the tree in branches. In contrast to this stormy image is the tranquil, moonlit summer evening set at a pond inhabited by two frogs. In fact, frog is the name of the um, print. Escher seems to have had a thing for frogs, judging from how many he depicted in his prints over his career. Here the Latin reads, silence is greater than every noise. Pretty cool thought. While the Dutch goes, the band of croakers pierces the summer night as best as it can, yet silence envelops all in stillness and dominates. Escher's picturesque evocative image foreshadows some upcoming works, as we will see. Now, on to the modern Escher. Escher described this print day and night as, quote, Having been logically born from the associations, light equals day and dark equals night. In the center of this bird's eye view, flat, roughly diamond shaped patches of fields between two small, virtually identical Dutch riverside villages, these fields quickly metamorphose upward into the silhouettes and then the three-dimensional forms of birds flying in opposite directions, literally earth taking flight. The fields continue below, their outlines becoming less defined and eventually become the day and night skies. The two skies melding through the shapes of the flying birds, the black ones headed toward the sunrise, the white ones into the deepening night. The two halves of day and night, left and right and day and night, are mirror images of one another, united by means of the gray fields out of which the birds gradually emerge. The left to right transition between day and night below is conveyed by subtle gradations of gray tones, which become progressively darker, moving from left to right. The idea of the birds arose from one of Escher's symmetry watercolors, which was made in the same month as the print. Day and Night is Escher's most popular composition. More than 650 examples of it exist, which means that Escher hand printed it more than 1300 times because there were two blocks required for each print. 
the watercolor we just looked at is in the collection of the Gemeente Museum in The Hague, the great repository of Escher's works, but a somewhat similar watercolor done slightly earlier than The Hague watercolor is included in the exhibition. Between the two, you can sense Escher's brain working to figure out how to have these interconnected birds fly left and right rather than up and down. And there's also another um, avian symmetry watercolor in the show. These are very rare. Um, I can tell you, you almost never see them come on the open market. So uh, there are several collectors who own several of these and they're never going to let them go. So if you really like the idea of owning an Escher watercolor, um, I will say now is your chance. Here is how Escher described this enigmatic, technically brilliant print called Encounter. Out from the gray surface of a, black, of a back wall, there develops a complicated pattern of white and black figures of little men. And since men who desire to live need at least a floor to walk on, a floor has been designed for them with a circular gap in the middle so that as much as possible can still be seen of the back wall. In this way, they're forced not only to walk in a ring, but also to meet each other in the foreground, a white optimist and a black pessimist shaking hands with one another. Here the flat figures emerge from a foggy background and become three-dimensional forms who circle around the opening. Escher saw them as optimists and pessimists, perhaps meeting at last and finding in real space the common ground from which they emerged. This is one of the relatively few images which feature interlocking flat forms which transform into three-dimensionality. Here are two works, um, one is Symmetry Inc. and another an early study for the figures. Um, thank goodness he changed from that study so that um, in the print, you don't have to look at the bare bottoms of these critters as these men as they walk along. Now, um, Escher is, or this encounter is only one of two major works Escher made during the German occupation of the Netherlands during World War II, when good woodblocks and good paper were scarce. Escher's characterization of the figures as optimist and pessimist is expressed through their different hand gestures. One, an open gesture of friendship, the other, a finger raised in warning. Now, when the print was first reproduced for sale, one art dealer hesitated to display it because he thought the features of the white figures resembled those of Hendrikus Kollein, who was a much beloved Dutch prime minister during the war and who actually died just a few months after this um, print was created. You have to tell me what you think. By the end of 1946, the Dutch people were eager to emerge from the darkness that had overshadowed the country for the previous seven years. One of the most emotionally powerful images Escher created, this work represents the hopes and confidence of the Dutch people. The motto at the bottom reads something like, we will get out of it, or we're coming out of it. The spirit and hope of an entire nation struggling to pull itself out of the darkness left by the German occupation and moving towards a brighter future. Here, um, perspectively thinking, the zenith point, the uppermost point is the vanishing point, which enhances the upward thrust of the composition. Now, the walls of the well are octagonal rather than round, but this calls to mind a grid-like caged pit from which the hands are climbing upward towards the sunlit landscape, a tree full in bloom, birds flying in the sky, 
and the security of a home, all symbols of a free and prosperous country. The work was commissioned by an artist and print collector society to honor the efforts of the Dutch underground, get it, during the war. Although something of a loner, Escher had a wide circle of erudite friends. For a number of them, he made book plates. I show two of my favorites here since they just happened to be included in the exhibition. Dr. Travolino, for whom the book, Mark, book um, uh, Ex Libris book plate was made on the left, was a psychologist who must have been, I mean, you think of a psychologist, what did he think of Escher's works? Look at the variety of materials and textures rendered here. Wood, metal, glass, paper, that is the book itself, wine, even the wisp of smoke that you can see coming off of the burning cigarette. Even the ex libris inscription is interesting. It's on two different planes, like the surfaces of a woodcut, which that would be the table, and a wood engraving, which is the side grain that you see um, where Dr. Um, Travolino's name is. Note how the gap between the planks forms the left edge of the letter R on the top. The book plate on the right was made for an acquaintance of Escher, the mathematician and the authority, the great authority on fractal geometry, Albert Bossman. I love the curled pages that Escher includes in both corners, as well as the cowering on a small scale caterpillar who rises up from the text. Now, here's something I've learned um, in working on this print. A caterpillar is not a bookworm. A bookworm is not a worm, but rather a description applied variously to a number of beetles, roaches, or silverfish. Another interesting aspect of the print um, is the text, which you would note is echoed in the caterpillar's skin. Now this text, Noti Noti, is a familiar Hindu Sanskrit chant or mantra translated um, either not this, not this, or neither this nor that, used in spiritual meditation or by practitioners of the jnana yoga. But somehow it seems appropriate for Escher in whose works we often see and encounter things that are not this nor that. In this work, Escher initiates a conversation with the viewer, beginning with its titles, three his, its title, three spheres. See the top sphere here? Is it really a sphere? Or is it just several small quadrangles arranged elliptically? Now study the middle sphere. Is it a sphere? or just the top one folded over. If it is, then the top one couldn't be a sphere because you can't fold a sphere, can you? Then the bottom sphere, it must be the flat one, the flat top or sphere or circle or whatever we're gonna call it now, laid horizontally. Escher wants to show us to understand that there are no spheres here, despite the title. The three forms are, quote, really only two-dimensional, and that it's only our brains that distort the objective proof. Now, I first encountered this print as I suspect many people of my generation um, in a dorm room or in some sort of head shop or whatever, um, where you could buy these kind of black light posters, um, where it was 
this brightly colored um, work, which became even more brightly colored when you took it back to your dorm room and turned on the black light is really groovy then. Um, so when I then encountered it um, in, let's say, real life and saw the print um, in black and white, I was at first a little put aside. But now when you see it, when you actually see this black light image, it's or this black and white image, it's pretty incredible. And I think here you can really see the kind of questions that Escher wants you to ask and answer. This is STARS, um, done just a few years later. Now, Escher was fascinated by astronomy and crystallography and geometry, three sciences that directly influenced this print. He was a lifelong amateur astronomer, and his personal notebooks were filled with observations of constellation stars and planets, which he studied with his tech telescope. The work reveals Escher's growing interest in regular geometric forms, in part stimulated by his interest in crystallography, which had been kindled by one of his brothers who was a crystallographer. The print depicts a hollowed out compound of three octahedra, another polyhedral compound composed of three interlocking regular octahedra floating in space and numerous other polyhedra and polyhedral com compounds. In order to depict these forms accurately, Escher made models of them from cardboard and wire. The existence, now the existence of what are now known as platonic solids, which, is, which are regular three-dimensional forms, were known since antiquity. Escher was familiar with the works of certain 15th and 16th century polymaths, such as Luca Pacioli, Daniel Barbaro, and Leonardo da Vinci. And these, the influence of these um, towering figures um, appears throughout Escher's career. Now, as Escher once himself once said, and I'm quoting here, if you were to ask me, why do you do such silly things, such absolute objective things that no longer have to do with anything personal? Then all I can answer is, I cannot stop it. This particular issue has never been satisfactorily resolved, as far as I know, by that group of folks around 1500 and 1600, Durer, Pacioli, Barbaro, and even Leonardo. Undoubtedly, they were originally interested in pure form in the same way that I am. The beauty and order of regular bodies are overwhelming. On the right, we see um, one illustration made by Leonardo for um, a, a publication by his close friend, Luca Pacioli. Escher's initial idea had been to put monkeys in the central cage, but he ultimately decided on chameleons, one which has a spiral tongue, since they are likewise equipped with prehensile tails which help them cling to the bars of their cage as it whirls through space. Escher also made a few hand-colored examples of this print, like you can see on the left here, as did the creators of the Black Light poster, another really famous one for teenagers back in the late 60s. Escher's colors, I think, are rather more subtle and muted than the Black Light artist's one, and it reminded me of that frog print where um, the motto is silence is louder than um, noise. Escher also made, a, um, sorry, in the exact center of this composition is a stellated dodecahedron whose form has been subtly enclosed and merged within a, within a translucent sphere like a soap bubble, Escher wrote. For Escher, this form epitomized mathematical order and beauty. Surrounding it is a disorderly 
chaotic hodgepodge of broken, crumpled, and useless objects. Escher was deeply concerned with the contrasting elements of order and chaos, as he expressed not only in his art, but also in his own words. Consider some of these quotes from the artist. In my prints, I try to testify that we live in a beautiful and orderly world and not in a formless chaos as it sometimes seems. Or we adore chaos because we love to produce order. Or through simplicity and order are perhaps though simplicity and order are perhaps not the principal guidelines for human beings in general. They are certainly important ones. The desire for simplicity and order helps us to endure and inspires us in the midst of chaos. Chaos is the beginning, order is the end. And finally, chaos is present everywhere in countless ways and forms while order remains an unattainable ideal. This is rippled surface. Um, and in it, we see how reflection has remained an important and recurring theme in this earth. Think, think back to that um, little self-portrait and sphere that we looked at long ago. Escher typically represented objects mirrored in flat or spherical reflective surfaces or more expansive areas reflected by surfaces in nature, as in the woodcut puddle, which we'll look at in a minute. Escher described this print in this way. Two raindrops fall into a pond with the concentric expanding ripples that they cause disturb the still reflection of a tree with the moon behind it. The rings shown in perspective afford the only means by which the receding surface of the water is indicated. Escher's son, George, related the story of how his father came up with the idea for this print while on one of his daily walks in the forest. In order to see the moon reflected in a black pond, through bare winter trees, Escher turned his back to the pond, bent forward so he could gaze at the water from between his legs, using his hands to conceal the bottom part of his view so he could no longer see the foreground. This perspective made it appear as if he were standing upright and staring at the sky. When an acorn fell into the pond, shattering the surface of the water, he realized that the concentric ripples were the only, the only indication that he was not looking up at the sky, but down into the water. This ambiguous perception is illustrated here, although Escher depicted the effect of two raindrops striking the water's surface, thus doubling and amplifying the patterns of ripples. Now, Escher made um, more than 15 studies of this, and as you can see with the center um, one in the, in the bottom row, he initially started out with just one, um, one ripple. But I think he made the, um, he made the decision, how could he better create the effect he wanted to make? And so he abandoned the one ripple idea and did 10 more drawings, carefully working out the relationship between the two um, ripples. It, it just, one of the things that I think you can say about Escher and his work is that he gets the idea in his mind, which may come easy to him, I don't know, but then he struggles because He's not satisfied with anything less than perfectly expressing that thought in his mind. And so you can see that Escher, throughout his, his art, he's a perfectionist. And when you get to see some of these drawings that he puts together behind the scene, that's what it's all about for him. It's solving this riddle about 
how can I do that? And it drove him to perfection. Here's a good example. At first glance, this seems to be a small section of a muddy, rutted path with a puddle left behind after a rain shower. An unusual subject, but something that most of us wouldn't even take the time to notice while on a walk. Escher himself modestly described this image, quote, the calm, cloudless evening sky is reflected in a puddle, which a shower has left behind in a rutted hollow of a woodland road. Traces of trucks, bicycles, and pedestrians are imprinted in the soggy ground, period. As with so many of Escher's images, however, the more time we spend studying the print, the more it reveals to us. Looking down, we see the immediate microcosm of the road, the tracks of a car, a tractor, two bicycles, and two pedestrians walking in opposite directions. But then we realize through the mirror of the puddle, this microcosm has become a macrocosmos. We are simultaneously looking downward and seeing the canopy of trees overhead, the endless space of the cloudless evening sky and the moon in the depths of the puddle. As we gaze deeply into this puddle, this intimate image thus acquires a vast spaciousness, a contradiction, a contradiction enhanced by the artist's subtle use of color, the soft brown of the dirt, the delicate green tone of the sky, and the glowing orb of the moon, created by carefully preserving an uninked circle on each of the three wood blocks. We then realize that this bit of a muddy path has actually become a natural frame for everything that rises above it. The construction of puddle is quite remarkable. For the reflection in the puddle, Escher returned to a woodcut he had made 19 years earlier. And using a detail cropped from the upper portion, and then turned it upside down to use it in the reflection for the puddle. Okay, puddle, how do I do this? Wait a minute, let me think back. Oh yeah, I made that print that shows some really nice trees in Corsica. Let me look at that. Oh, well, how can I make that work? Well, okay, I'm gonna make a detail of that. And then, to really make it work the way I want to, I'm gonna turn it upside down and then make the print. That's what I mean by he has an idea and these prints are all about how can I make this idea appear in two dimensions. Three worlds. This is one of my very favorite prints. Escher described this work, the genesis of this work in this way. I was walking over a little bridge in the woods near my home and there it was right before my eyes. I simply had to make a print of it. The title emerged directly from the scene itself. I returned home and started straight away on the drawing. Now Escher's title for this tranquil and mysterious late autumn landscape offers insight into the way he looked at the world around him, particularly in the way that the reflective and transparent surface of the water serves as a kind of interface between the other two worlds above and below it. Three worlds, okay? The fish is in and under the water. The leaves float on the water's surface and the trees reflected in the water are above and beyond everything else. Note how these worlds interact, where you can see along the left side where the freshly fallen leaves and bare trees, reflections of the bare trees, overlap. It's always been interesting to me as the trees are bare because 
all of the leaves have fallen on the ground and the pond. And yet the leaves that Escher shows look like they've just fallen in the last minute. I mean, their edges are really crisp. <clears throat> they haven't become kind of soggy and wilted, wilted. So it's just another one of these, did Escher want us to notice that? I don't know. Um, so the trunks and branches of the trees, truncated by the upper border of the print, appear to lie in the water. But then we realize that what we see is a reflection, just like we saw in Ripple's surface. The trees are beyond the edge of the picture, and the world, or at least one of them, is upside down. Three Worlds is the last of the three prints, Ripple's surface and Puddle being the other two, in which the world is reflected in water. I want to show you just a couple of um, studies for this work. Um, you notice in this work on the left, where we see three trees, but what you really can notice here is that these were actually three separate drawings that Escher somehow cut and put together to form the idea for what he shows in the print. The carp is, he made several studies of the carp, of this particular carp. It's such a cool animal and I, a, a cool fish, sorry. And I heard rumors that Escher actually had some sort of silk tapestry of a carp and that was actually where he modeled it from. Then here's the final drawing um, where you have to imagine that everything is sort of reversed here. So this is the final drawing that he used um, for the lithographic stone. And here is a picture of the actual stone used to create the print. The X in the middle there is what Escher insisted were put on um, all of his lithographic stones um, for his woodcuts and prints, he insisted that holes be drilled through them so that no one else could reproduce them after his death. But it's really still pretty neat to look at the actual stone from which all of the examples of this print were made. In this work, Relativity, Escher united three different worlds, each with its own gravitational force within a single architectural construction. The virtually identical inhabitants of this structure are shown going about their daily routines. Although the normal rules of gravity apply to the inhabitants of each individual world, the 16 figures, which are divided into three groups of six, five, and five, they can be described as uprighters, left leaners, and right leaners. These figures could not logically coexist in the same world. The five uprighters, like the figure ascending the staircase at the bottom of the print, and the two figures on the staircase, one ascending and one descending above and to his left, are those whose world makes gravitational sense if we look at Escher's print oriented in the usual way with the artist's monogram in the upper left corner. Yet each of the figures walking up the stairs is paired with another on the underside of the stairs. The six left leaners, among them the figure emerging from a staircase with a sack over his shoulder and the one carrying the basket in the lower left corner, are the figures who appear upright and whose gravity appear normal when the print is rotated 90 degrees clockwise, as in the case on the left. Only when the print is rotated 90 degrees counterclockwise from its traditional orientation, as on the right, do the five right leaners, like the group enjoying a meal al fresco, or the seated figure reading a book near the sack carrying left leaner, only then do they become gravitationally correct. Each world has its own staircases, which can only be used by its inhabitants, 
although both the upper and under sides of some staircases can be used by inhabitants of different worlds. As the artist explained, it's impossible for the inhabitants of different worlds to walk or sit or stand on the same floor because they have differing conceptions of what is horizontal and what is vertical. Yet they may well share the use of the same staircase. On the top staircase, stop it on the top staircase, oops, illustrated here, Two people are moving side by side and in the same direction, and yet only one of them is going downstairs and the other one is going upstairs. Contact between them is out of the question because they live in different worlds and therefore can have no knowledge of each other's existence. As the creator of these three worlds, Escher was undoubtedly correct when he said that contact between them was impossible. Consider the, <clears throat> look at these figures again on the staircase. And what happens if the uprighter at the bottom encountered the right leaner servant holding a platter with a bottle of wine on it? Given in the context, it might be accurate to say on top of it rather than, it might be inaccurate to say on top of it. Who, who descends the stair in front of, above, and him, that servant? Which way is he going? Or what would the left wiener carrying the sack make of the uprighter descending the staircase on the other side of the one used by the servant with the wine bottle? There are no kinds. These are the kinds of puzzles and brain games that Escher enjoyed presenting to us in his prints. One other aspect is worth noting. Um, remember I told you that um, the architecture of Escher's middle school influenced his later work. This is exactly what I meant. Look at these sort of colliding um, staircases. To me, again, Escher is 15 years old when he's going to this school. And yet somehow he probably had that staircase in mind when he first came up with the idea for the print. I just think that's amazing. In May of 1955, Escher created this wood engraving, Rind, which portrays a woman, probably his wife Yitta, as a ribbon-like hollow sculpture floating through a cloud-filled space. However, he found this, and I quote, abruptly ending strip not altogether satisfying. And he sought to remedy it in the print called Bond of Union. Escher made 25 studies to create this work. Um, from the initial portrait studies of his son, George, and his daughter-in-law, Corey, through his developing the link between the heads and to a final study in which he carefully determined the size and position of every one of the spheres floating in front of, within, and behind the hollow forms to enhance the illusion of the space within the composition. You can see here, and every one of these balls has a, a specific number or letter, so he can, which is based on their size. He, there are several of these drawings, but this is the final one where he's actually realized, how is he gonna do that? And you can see here, these balls, they really do serve to create this illusion of the figures floating in a vast space. But like so many of his prints, he's only able to realize this by careful study and technical virtuosity. I like this quote very much and um, take a little time to read it before I show you the next um, print. It's, I think, perfectly appropriate, appropriate to it. This is Belvedere or Belvedere as the Italians would say. 
And here's the way Escher described it. In the lower left background, there lies a piece of paper, or, sorry, in the lower left foreground, there lies a piece of paper on which the edges of a cube are drawn. You can see that a little better in the detail on the right. Two small circles mark the places where the edges cross each other. Which edge comes at the front and which edge at the back? Good question. In a three-dimensional world, simultaneous front and back is quite an impossibility and so cannot be illustrated. Yet it is quite possible to draw an object which displays a different reality when looked at from above and from below. The lad sitting on the bench has got just such a cube-like odd, <clears throat> just such a cube-like absurdity in his hands. He gazes thoughtfully at this incomprehensible object, and he seems oblivious to the fact that the Belvedere behind him has been built in the same impossible style. On the floor of the lower platform, that is to say indoors, stands a ladder which two people are busy climbing. But as soon as they arrive at a floor higher than they are back in the open, they're back in the open air and have to re-enter the building. Is it any wonder that nobody in this company can be bothered about the fate of the prisoner in the dungeon who sticks his head through the bars and bemoans his fate? There are a couple of other points I wanna make here. Look at the detail on the right here and notice the bars on the prisoner's cell. It's a really small detail, but if you look carefully at like how they're actually put together, the horizontal and the verticals, they can't possibly be that way. There is no way that those, that that grate could be created. It's just one of those things. I, Escher probably wanted you to see it. Maybe he didn't want you to see it right away, but it's exactly what I mean by the more closely you study Escher's print, the more times you see it, the more times you notice it. I mean, I must have looked at this print 20 times before I focused in on that one little detail and just how weird it is, but you have to look carefully to, to see that it's weird. Is Escher's building so unbelievable in this age of Photoshop? Check out this Belvedere. <laughs> uh, it's, it's just amazing what you can do with Photoshop, I have to say. There exists a 3D model of Escher's creation, which does appear okay when you view it from, oh, no, no. Sorry, wrong model, we'll get to that, okay? One other point I wanna make here. The figures strolling up the stairs in the foreground are derived from two figures in the right-hand panel of Hieronymus Bosch's absolutely famous um, Garden of Earthly Delights done about 1504. Now, Escher, had earlier copied a section of this panel in a 1935 lithograph, which you can see here. This is the only artwork Escher ever copied in one of his prints. But this homage to the great Netherlandish artist seems appropriate to this fantastic creation. Now, see the figures going up the stairs before. Here is the detail from Escher's um, work. And you can see that in Bosch's painting and in Escher's faithful copy, the fellow on the left or on the right is naked. Well, I guess he didn't, he decided that he couldn't quite do that in the print. So it's a very similar pose, but he put clothes on the figure. The pose of the woman is actually spot on. So again, he's just making a little tip of the hat to the greatest fantastic painter of the Netherlands um, prior to him, maybe. This is Waterfall, 
one of Escher's most celebrated prints. It features a paradoxical element. The water found on the base of the waterfall seems to run downhill, which is along the water's path, but then it reaches the top part of the waterfall. How does that happen? This lithograph represents a seemingly normal structure featuring a water course and a water wheel. To a typical observer, it may appear as though everything is in its perfect place. However, the closer you look, you discover a number of inexplicable elements. The water falls straight down, but then the water flows up right to the top. The towers, although the towers um, are equally high, the left one is one story higher than the other. Escher described this as an image that, that represents an illusion that is an ever present element in the real world. He based waterfall on the brilliant concept of the impossible triangle, the tri-bar seen here on the right. It, um, a British physicist and mathematician named Penrose came up with, and Escher and Penrose became really close friends through their correspondence here. Um, in the print, Escher wrote, the impossible triangle is fitted three times into this picture. Falling water keeps a mill wheel, mill wheel in motion and subsequently flows along a sloping channel between the two towers, zigzagging down to the point where the waterfall begins again. The miller simply needs to add a bucket full of water from time to time in order to compensate for loss through evaporation. The polyhedrons on the towers on the top have no special significance. I put them there simply because I like them so much. To the left, three intersecting cubes, to the right, three octahedrons. So here are the drawings that Escher used um, to do it. And you can see there are, I think, 20 drawings where he's trying to get the perspective straight using the Penrose triangle as his guide. Now, there's one other thing about this um, that has always fascinated me. Um, it's the very odd garden in the lower left corner. It looks to me, it's always looked to me like it should be under the ocean. There's something very marine-like about it. We know that Escher actually drew this study, um, the study that ended up appearing in Waterfall in 1942. So you've got to figure that it was, let's see, 19 years later that somehow, <laughs> somehow we thought, you know, I'd really like to put a garden there. Oh, wait a minute. I know I have that drawing that I made 19 years ago. Maybe that would be perfect for him. And it is because it's so weird looking. Now, he may have come across this chunk of turf on a walk near his home, but it looks too strange for that scenario. I kind of wonder almost if he copied it from a book, a biology book or something like that, but um, I guess we'll never know. All right, finally, I'd like to end with these two little vignettes that are included in the exhibition. In 1953, the Society for the Promotion of Graphic Arts published a limited portfolio of a graphic alphabet to which its members have been asked to submit original prints, each representing a single letter of the alphabet. Escher submitted the two initials of his name, M for Mauritz and E for Escher. M also stands for Mauk, um, his nickname, uh, for his family and close friends. And this woodcut of a mouse, the word in Dutch is muis, muis, shows a potentially infinite row of M's. This is something that you don't really notice at first, okay? You see the M in the foreground, but then when you look more closely at this undulating line, you realize that they're all little M's that shrink and grow back 
um, almost like little blocks that go back and that go back and back. So they're really, um, I haven't bothered to count, but let's just say dozens of M's that grow smaller and larger as they wind back towards the tail. The two prints were made utilizing different techniques. The M is a woodcut with black lines on a white background, while the E was done as a wood engraving with the white lines carved into the black surface of the block. Escher's E wood engraving depicts the head of an open mouthed donkey. The Dutch word here is ezel, sticking its head through a gap in a background wall composed of interlocking and reversed light and dark E's as it forms a tilted plane seemingly flying through space. The donkey casts a shadow over the E's below him, an effect that could only be rendered via the wood engraving technique. The braying sound, E made by the beast, is echoed throughout the composition. Escher's decision to use these two creatures, the shy little mouse and the stubborn donkey to portray his name might reveal his thoughts about his own personality. So I'd like to thank you all for putting up with my technical um, inability and for sticking around for the exhibition. Um, I'm ready for any questions you might have. So. Oh, thank you so much, David. That was wonderful. Um, and thank you for everybody who stuck around. Um, we have a couple questions that were posed in the chat that I will read to you now. Um, Mick asked a question, has Escher spoken in more detail about his preference or tendency to use his motifs and shapes to consume all of the available space with interlocking shapes rather than shapes against some other background or not interlocking? Do you know the genesis of this perception? Well, I think a lot of that came from what he saw at the um, Alhambra. Uh. Um, I think there where there were just their whole walls where all of these forms interlock and form a pattern. In some of his early symmetry drawings, he's still, it's still a little awkward. Um, but I think it was soon interlocking these figures that really became his focus. You think about those two bird um, watercolors that we looked at where, okay, in the early one, the birds are interlocked, but they're sort of, the pattern is vertical not the way birds function, but he refined it and did it the way birds, an interlock pattern of birds actually fly. And that became the genesis of day and night. So I would say for these, for Escher, these interlocking figures just became another pattern. And throughout his entire life, I mean, think about every print we looked at practically here, pattern is the key. And so I think, yes, the initial genesis of it probably happened when he went to the Alcazar. But if you remember that quote, I said, Escher basically said he'd had that, he'd, he'd had that feeling inside of him even before he went there. It was just that being at the Alhambra kind of opened it up for him. Lovely. Um, I'm not sure Stephen's in the room anymore, but he said, so great to see his work again. And do you think he looked at or was inspired by certain photographers or photographs? Since we don't have um, any, I don't know of any evidence um, that Escher, he was an amateur photographer. Okay, but I don't have any interest, any idea whether or not there were particular photographers that caught his eye. I will say that I firmly believe that Escher influenced a great number of photographers. So um, that's what I think. Um, and another interesting question um, from Christian. 
I now realize that many figures have a scarf or something else on their heads. There is no hair. Is that a coincidence or on purpose? And in parentheses, carving hair can't be easy. Oof. Um, I will say, you know, I've never really given that a great deal of thought. Um, no, I would say that's just coincidence. I don't know that he's um, making a statement one way or another about the beauty of bald or the beauty of hair. I'm looking at the Scholastica pieces now and the witch has some hair. So we'll, we'll share that. Oh yeah, website. she's a witch. Come yeah, on. of course. <laughs> um, cool, well, it doesn't look like there's um, any other questions. So anything, last things want to add? I have a question. Other than Bosch, was there any uh, artistic influences upon which he drew or that you see or well, are knowledgeable think, about? I do think those um, geometric solids that people like Barbaro and um, Pacioli were doing, mm -hmm. he never, I, I can't think of a single work in which he actually quotes another artist's work. I can certainly tell you that um, he didn't think very highly of contemporary artists who just, I think in one thing he says, well, they just paint their feelings and who cares about them except the artist. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you can tell that because for him, if he saw somebody just sitting down, there were a few Dutch painters, Carol Apple and is one, where he watched a, a video of Apple painting and in, in five minutes, Apple had rendered a, a work of art. Escher hated that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, for him, that's because they didn't take the time to think about what they wanted to express. They just did it. It's completely opposite. Mm -hmm. So. Um, well, maybe there was an architect that inspired him since there's so much architecture in his work. Um, well, yeah, and remember that he initially studied to be exactly. an architect. Mm -hmm. And I think one of his brothers was also an architect as well. His mm -hmm. father was an engineer, so I'm mm -hmm. certain that Escher got to look at a lot of buildings right. when he was a young boy. But for someone who disclaims uh, an alliance with contemporaries, I, I see a lot of contemporaries that are not so removed from his genre, if you will. Uh huh. Well, I, I'm sure I'm trying to think of contemporary printmakers and the ones that I think of that look like Escher came after Escher. Um, there are certain, I think there are, thinking back, there are some 16th and 17th century German printmakers that mm -hmm. play with space and play with architecture, but I just don't know whether Escher saw them or not. And, and he doesn't really, I mean, when you think of the great Dutch printmakers, mm -hmm. uh, Escher doesn't bother with them. Not that I can tell. No, but it's interesting that he chose the woodblock as the form of interpret original and form of interpretation. Oh, sure, sure. I think that's right. And, and for some reason, he never liked, apparently, etching was not his thing. So, um, you know, right from this, he, he made two etchings and I think that was it when he was really young. And after that, it was wood blocks and um, mm -hmm. wood engravings and um, lithographs, you know, things like that, lino cuts, which he made mostly early in his art and then returned to it in uh, rippled surface because that was done at a time when he couldn't get good wood to make uh, his prints anymore. So he had to go back to cheap lino cuts. Thank you. Um, to elaborate a little bit, you mentioned that his father was an engineer and was likely influential on Escher. Um, did Escher ever himself engage in engineering work? Uh, this was asked by Jason. Oh, sure. He engaged in engineering all the time, but only in two dimensions, <laughs> never in real life. It's funny though, if you, um, 
just have nothing better to do, you should Google Escher cartoons where it seems to be a favorite motif of people, um, of cartoonists showing different buildings made by different people that influence Escher or that they attribute to Escher. Really neat. Well, there's a lot of nice, nice comments in the chat, like how he likely inspired computer graphic design. I totally agree. Um, a nice note uh, from Roger, thanking you for your essay for the Greg Museum catalog. Um, <laughs> so we can export all of these, David, yeah. and send them to you. Um, one thing that you mentioned about video games, when I did the show in Raleigh, we were, I mean, really surprisingly um, inundated with interest from gamers and game designers. And in fact, um, Epic Games, the guy who designed Fortnite, um, came to the museum. I took him around and he said that so he knows so many gamers and game designers um, who just worship at Escher's feet and who, who, who got a lot of their ideas, at least initially, from Escher's playfulness and technical brilliance. I believe it. Excellent. So. I think we're all done now. Um, so we're going to, we have recorded this and we'll post it on our website and also send it out to everybody who registered. Uh, so have a look out for that. And okay, and if you can find that um, app that is going to make me look better that Bruce was talking about, you can run it through there. Too. Makes you nice and soft. David, thank you so much. This has been okay. a, a real pleasure, a learning experience, and, uh, and an honor to uh, work with you and get to know you. Um, and thank you all for joining us today. Uh, remember that we'll be posting this on our website, uh, a recording feel free to uh, forward it to uh, friends. And uh, uh, thank you again for joining and have a good day. Okay, bye-bye.